Hello and welcome to the MagTech 4 Software Overview. In this video, we'll be looking at the MagTech 4 software which serves as the heart of MagTech's workflow. This video is intended to serve as an introduction and overview of the basic features required by most users who are new to the software. Some of the more advanced or niche features won't be covered, but if you require more information than is provided in this video, please refer to your software manual or contact MagTech's customer service for more details. Once you've installed and opened up the software, it's first important to learn the layout. The interface is broken up into three distinct sections, each of which has its own subsections and is specialized towards interacting with specific elements of the software. At the very top is the navigation. This is the key point of reference when searching for different tools and features. Just about every available function is represented by one of these icons. Due to the volume of functionality, and to keep your navigation focused on the task at hand, it has been divided into three sections represented by these tabs, Files, Devices, and Reports. Selecting a tab will bring up its relevant functions here in what's called the Menu Bar. The middle section is called the Control Panel, and is primarily used to quickly access your files and manage your connected devices. And finally at the bottom is the Display Panel. This section is used to view and manage your data, as well as customize your reports. Before moving forward, it's also good to know that MagTech 4 is available in a number of languages. To change the default language, go to the File tab and select Options here at the bottom. Then select Display, scroll down until you find the language options, and select your preference. You're probably already familiar with the File tab, as it contains all the standard functions you'd expect to find in most other softwares. In here you can generate new reports, open existing reports, save your files, print reports, and as established, options, where you can adjust a number of default software settings. We'll come back to this quite a bit later. Now let's talk about managing your devices and all the features listed under the Device Menu tab. You'll see that most of these features are currently grayed out, and this is because to access these features, you must first have a device connected. So let's do that now. Depending on your device, it may connect directly to your computer via USB, or it may require a docking station. For more information on this, please refer to your device manual. Once your device has been connected to your PC, it will appear automatically in your control panel under Connected Devices. You'll notice after connecting the device, we now have access to the functions listed above. If multiple devices are connected, make sure the correct device is selected before adjusting any settings, as indicated by the yellow highlight. Now that we're connected, let's learn how to record. There are actually four different ways to start your device, as indicated by these four green icons on the left side of the device menu bar. If this is your first time using your connected device, or if you're looking to start your device with new parameters, you want to select the largest icon labeled Custom Start. This opens up a sub-menu where you can adjust a number of parameters. First is the Start method, where you can choose to either have the logger start recording immediately, or have it delay until a specific date and time. Some devices may also feature a manual start, which means you can start the device with a button located on the device itself. Refer to your device manual for more information. For the stop method, you can either manually stop the device after reconnecting it to the software, or you can set up an automatic stop at a specific date and time. The reading interval controls the rate at which your device will record data, so as indicated here, it will take a reading every one second while it's recording. And finally, you may choose to enable wraparound. All of MagTech's data loggers have built-in memory for storing data with some storing thousands or even millions of readings before reaching capacity. Enabling wraparound means that in the event the data logger runs out of storage, it will start recording over the oldest stored data rather than stopping. Once you have your desired settings, click Start. You'll then notice the device status will change to either running or waiting to start depending on the start method you've selected. Once this is done, you may disconnect the logger and place it in the study environment. If you selected manual stop or would like to stop your device ahead of its predetermined stop time, you can do this by connecting your device to the software and selecting stop in the device menu bar. Once the device is stopped recording, you can then download data from your device to your computer by selecting the download button. This will automatically generate a graph report which appears in your display panel. We'll discuss graphs and other reports in more detail later. The software also features three other start methods. Quick Start will start your device using the most recent custom start settings. This is great if you don't change your parameters very often and just want to get up and running quickly. Real Time Start will ask for your parameters similar to Custom Start, but will arrange for the device to transmit its recordings directly to the software in real time. Keep in mind that this function requires that your device either has wireless functionality or that it remains connected to the computer by other means during the recording. Please refer to your device manual for more details. Batch Start is used to select parameters and start multiple devices at the same time using the same settings. 
Hitting the reset button will restore a device to its default settings, erase alarms, and delete all readings currently stored on the device. Keep in mind that once you've done this, readings stored on the device cannot be retrieved, so ensure you've downloaded all necessary data before doing a reset. And with that, you've now learned everything you need to know in order to use your device to record data. The remainder of this section will focus on automation and exploring some of the more advanced device features. Now let's talk about workflows. Workflows allow users to automate a number of tasks, such as downloading data, creating reports, and more, in order to streamline your workflow and save time. These are especially relevant when your studies are routine and repetitive in nature. Functionally, workflows create a safe set of instructions that tell the software to automatically perform a set of tasks when certain conditions are met. Conditions may include dates and times, or when specific devices are connected. Let's create one. Begin by selecting the workflow icon in the device menu bar. Then select New on the right side of the window and this box will open up. Enter a name for your new workflow. Make sure to use words and phrases that will remind you of its function. For this example, we're going to have our device stop recording automatically when it connects, so that we don't have to manually hit the stop button. Next, select the conditions that must be met in order to trigger the actions. Here I'm going to select the High Temp 140 I've connected, and this will make this workflow exclusive to this specific device. If I wanted to have this apply to any High Temp 140 I connected, I would instead select Choose Device Model. I'll also choose Connected. Note that this means it triggers at the moment the device is connected, and so will not be triggered until I reconnect the device. If I was planning a real-time start, and was planning to leave the device connected to the PC, I could instead choose a date and time. You can add multiple conditions, but keep in mind that the listed actions will trigger when any listed condition is met. And now we'll select our action where I'll tell the device to stop recording. And that's it, so we'll select OK. Sometimes you'll want to go back in and adjust a workflow you've already created. You can do this by first highlighting the workflow to be edited, and then selecting Properties. You'll notice that all of the options are currently grayed out. This is because active workflows cannot be edited, so we'll have to disable it first. To disable a workflow, make sure it's highlighted, and then hit the Disable button. You'll notice its listed status has also changed. Now we can go back in and make our adjustments. When you're all finished, hit OK, and make sure you enable your workflow afterwards, or it won't activate. You can also duplicate a workflow. This is useful if you'd like to create multiple workflows with small adjustments between them. First select the workflow you'd like to copy, and then click Duplicate. Make sure you give it a different name, and then make adjustments as needed, and click OK. The new workflow will be added to your list and is enabled by default. Sometimes you might want to run a workflow when the conditions haven't been met, either to run it ahead of schedule or on an already connected device. First select the workflow you'd like to run, and then click Run. This will cause the workflow's listed actions to immediately trigger, ignoring the conditions. And if you'd like to delete a workflow, you can do so by selecting it and clicking Delete. And that's all you need to know in order to start exploring workflows. Feel free to browse the functions and find the settings best for you. Next, let's talk about alarms. Like workflows, alarms are triggered by a chosen condition, but are used to alert you when certain thresholds are met during recording. This is useful when the study must meet certain standards, or if your subject is particularly sensitive to your measured variables. There are two types of alarms, software alarms and device alarms. Software alarms are used for real-time recordings and only apply to devices connected to your PC, wirelessly or otherwise. Device alarms are stored directly on the device and do not require a real-time connection to function, but are only available on select models. We'll start with software alarms since they're available to all users, regardless of what device is being used. Just remember that software alarms only work for devices that are started in real time and remain connected to your computer. Conditions that trigger alarms are called alarm rules. To add an alarm rule, you must first select Manage Rules in the device menu bar and then click New. First, enter a name that describes its purpose. For this example, we'll set an alarm for when the temperature gets too high. You can then decide whether the alarm will trigger only when all conditions are met, or if any single condition is met. Now we'll choose those conditions. You can choose what devices this alarm applies to, the type and value of your threshold, and the duration that the threshold must be exceeded before tripping the alarm. So if we wanted our alarm to be instantaneous, I'll set it to one reading so that it instantly trips when it's exceeded. Now we'll decide what actions the software will take. As a standard, you'll always get a visual notification on the software, but you can also choose to have emails and text alerts, and if you're an advanced user, you can even trigger other programs to run automatically in response. If you'd like to receive email and text notifications, you'll first have to set it up by going to Email Options, which can be found here as well as in the Options menu. In here, you'll enter the required information, including your server address, the source email, and security information. 
If you need some extra help setting this up, please contact Magitech support staff and they'll walk you through it. Then we'll add a new contact to determine who will be receiving the email and text alerts. Once you're all finished, double check that your information is correct and click OK. If you'd like to make adjustments to an existing alarm, first select the alarm you'd like to change and then click the edit button. Adjust the alarm settings as needed and click OK. Enabling and disabling your alarms is as simple as selecting this icon to the right of the listed alarms. Red means disabled, green means enabled. You can also remove an alarm altogether by selecting an alarm and clicking the delete button. If you'd like to delete all your alarms, you can instead click the delete all button. So now that we've set our alarms, let's talk about what happens when you get one. Whenever an alarm notification appears, you can choose to either dismiss the alarm or acknowledge it. If you dismiss it, it will disappear and no further action is required. If you acknowledge the alarm, you'll have the opportunity to specify an action as well as make notes to be included in your report. If you find yourself frequently adding the same notes to your alarms, it's also possible to create a comment template in order to streamline the process. To create a comment template, first go to the File tab and click Options. From here, select Alarms and click New. You can name your template and create your standard comments below, then click OK. The predefined templates will now be available in the Alarm Log window and can be applied as desired. Now we're going to talk about device alarms, but first we need to discuss properties. When a device is connected, you can review all information about a connected device as well as adjust different settings in order to customize its functionality. To do this, first select the device you'd like to customize or review, then either select Properties up in the Device menu bar or right-click on the device and select Properties. Now I said we were going to discuss device alarms, but you'll see that there's no setting here for that. The Properties menu for all devices are customized to only show features that are compatible with the device. To learn more, please refer to your device manual. The Hi Temp 140 doesn't feature device alarms, and so we'll have to switch devices to demonstrate. Now that we've connected our new device, we'll open up the Properties menu and select Alarms. Device alarms are functionally exactly like software alarms, but do not require your device to be connected to the PC and have a different interface for selecting thresholds. To activate an alarm, simply check the box next to the high and or low threshold and enter that threshold's value. The delay setting states how long a threshold must be exceeded before issuing an alarm. The cumulative alarm delay checkbox indicates whether the alarm delay resets after values fall back within the threshold. Once you're happy with your alarm settings, hit apply at the bottom. If you'd like to use these same alarm settings in the future, you can save them as a template by hitting save. Give it a name, click OK, and now it's available in the template drop-down menu for future use. When device alarms are triggered, the alarm logs are stored directly on the device. If you'd like to clear the stored alarm data, you can hit clear alarms here at the top. And that's all there is to say about alarms. So next, let's talk about triggers. Triggers are an automation feature that enables a device to automatically start and stop recording based on predetermined thresholds. This helps to reduce your workload by cutting off periods of inactivity, like when the device is sitting in a cold oven prior to testing. If the trigger tab is missing from the properties menu, it means the device is not capable of this feature. To begin, select the trigger tab under properties. Triggers have two different modes to choose from. Window mode enables you to start recording based on a single threshold and gives you the option to record a set number of samples before stopping. Note that the threshold in window mode only serves as a start trigger. If you'd like to set both a start and a stop threshold, you'll need to use two-point mode, but for simplicity, we're going to start with window mode. As you can see, there are two options. A high trigger is a threshold that must be exceeded in order to start recording. This is intended for environments like ovens where your variables will be increasing. A low trigger is the opposite. The readings must drop below the threshold in order to start recording. This is intended for environments like freezers where your variables will be decreasing. If you ever forget what these mean, you can reference the graphic here. As long as the device is within the gray range, in this case between 0 and 50 degrees C, it will not record. Should it hit either of these blue ranges, it will start recording. The trigger sample count indicates how many readings the device will record after a trigger before stopping. You can have the device record until it fills its internal memory by checking this box, or if you wanted to have it record for, say, half an hour, we could set it to record 1800 readings. At one reading per second sample rate, that comes out to 30 minutes of recording. After the sample count is reached, the device will stop recording until it is triggered again. When you're happy with your settings, hit apply. Two-point mode also has a high trigger and a low trigger, but each of these features both a start and a stop threshold. This can get complicated, so let's start with just the high trigger. Right now our device will start recording if it hits 50C, and afterwards it will stop only when it hits 0.02C. 
For my study, I'd like to start and stop at roughly the same point, but it's important to know that the start and stop values cannot be the same. Additionally, the start value must also exceed the stop value. This is to prevent the stop trigger from being hit immediately after the device starts. So to get as close as I can, I'll set it to 49.99C, which is close enough for my purposes. So with that, our device will now start recording when it hits 50C, and will continue recording until it drops and hits 49.99C. The low trigger works exactly the same, but in the opposite direction. If you'd like to have both high and low triggers active, the graphic will help you visualize the result. When you're happy with your settings, hit apply. Additionally, if you'd like to use these exact settings again in the future, you can create a template by hitting save at the bottom. Give it a name, and now it's available in the template drop-down menu to be applied automatically in the future. Now that we've set our trigger, you'll notice that when I go to start the device, the status changes to waiting for trigger, indicating that the settings were successful. Now it's finally time to talk about graphs and reports. Reports have their own full set of features that can be accessed by selecting the Reports tab at the top, opening up the Reports menu bar. To start off, there are three types of reports that can be generated by the Magitek 4 software. Graph reports are the standard and plot your data on a simple XY graph. Data table reports provide a detailed list of all recorded data points, and statistics reports consolidate data based on the relationships between the readings. Graph reports are by far the most extensive, so we'll start with those. But before we dive into customizing your graphs for the purpose of reports, let's discuss a couple features associated with real-time monitoring. Real-time monitoring is when you reference your graph as data is being actively recorded via the real-time start mentioned earlier. There's a couple settings you can use to customize this experience. First, you'll notice that as data is being recorded, the default is for the graph to constantly compress its horizontal axis. This can make data difficult to monitor over long periods, and so you can opt to enable auto-scroll at the top. This will stop the horizontal compression and instead side-scroll the graph, updating it with only the latest readings. The next tip is the vertical access lock. So sometimes when you're monitoring, you'll have incidents which cause a massive spike, dramatically compressing key data on your vertical axis. If you'd like to avoid this, wait until your readings are within your expected range, and then select Lock Vertical Scale in the Reports menu bar. Now you'll see that when a spike occurs, the vertical scale does not compress and instead stays within your range. So now that you've finished recording and downloading your data to a graph, let's talk about the different tools you can use to organize it. The first thing you'll want to know is how to change your units. To do this, simply go to the top and locate the units drop-down menu and select the units relevant to your report. If you'd like to change the default units for future graphs, you can do so by going into File and selecting Options. Click the Units tab and you'll see all the different options available to you for different types of readings. You can also choose which line colors you prefer to represent each unit. If you'd like to restore the default settings, you can hit Clear Unit Preferences at the bottom. While graph reports are generally easy to read, it's sometimes necessary to apply context to certain readings, like incorporating an events log to explain certain anomalies. To do this, you can add annotations to your graph. To add an annotation, first make sure the relevant graph report is featured in the display panel. On the Reports menu bar, select Add Annotation to Graph. You can also right-click directly on the graph and select Add Graph Annotation. After an annotation has been added and filled out, you can toggle them on and off for visibility by clicking the pin icon at the top right of the annotation. You can also add annotations to a specific graph point if desired. To do this, you must first click and drag in order to locate the specific point you'd like to annotate. Then right-click and select Annotate Selected Point. This annotation will now indicate a specific reading on your graph. Now let's talk about cooling flags. Cooling flags are annotations that are automatically generated when certain thresholds are met. To begin, click the cooling flags icon located in the report menu bar. This pulls up the cooling flags window where you can manage aspects like whether the flags are displayed, the name of your flags, adjusting the threshold values, and adding additional flags as needed. You can also choose to set these flags as your defaults for future projects by hitting Set as Default at the bottom. And just like that, the software will automatically generate annotations at each point the thresholds were exceeded. If you'd like to highlight data based on only a portion of the graph, you can create what's called a time slice. Begin by selecting Time Slice in the Reports menu bar. This will bring a drop-down menu where you'll check the box labeled Enable Time Slice. The range of your time slice can be adjusted in multiple ways. The first method is to enter the start and stop times of the time slice in these boxes if you already have those numbers in mind. The second method is to manipulate the time slice directly on the graph. You can do this by clicking and dragging at the outer edges in order to narrow and widen its range. 
You can click and drag on the center of the time slice in order to shift the entire range without changing its length. And if at any time you'd like to reset the time slice to incorporate all data, you can hit select all to highlight all data on the graph. Value lines are horizontal lines that can be added to your graph to reference specific calculations or user-selected values within the recorded data. To add a value line to your graph, you must first select the value lines icon in the reports menu bar. You can also right-click on the graph and select add value line. Select a line type and then click OK. Your value line has now been added to the management window. Here you can adjust various aspects of your line including the name, position, line thickness, and the color. You must also choose which channel the value line applies to. This line is calculating the average, so by selecting the temperature channel, it will mark the average temperature throughout the study. You can create additional value lines by selecting Add at the bottom. We'll go ahead and create a fixed value for this next one. You'll see that it's mostly the same, but it doesn't automatically generate a title, and it also asks for a user value at the bottom. If you'd like to adjust your existing value lines, just right-click on the graph and select Manage Value Lines. Then select the value line you'd like to adjust on the left pane and make your modifications. To remove a value line from your graph, you would instead click Remove. Time markers are a visual representation of specific times within the recorded data. It appears as a vertical line in a graph report or as a colored row in a data table. Time markers are organized into collections, and you can modify the properties of a collection to apply settings to all time markers within that collection. To add one, right-click the graph and select Add Time Marker. Your time marker has now been generated as part of a new collection. You can toggle the visibility of your collection on and off, change the name of your collection, and of course, edit and add new time markers as needed. For this example, I'm going to create markers that indicate the official start and end of my study for reference. You can also toggle which side of the line your labels are on for readability. Once you're happy with your settings, you can click close. You can also adjust both the vertical and horizontal scales of your graph in order to better frame your data. To do this, start by selecting the Set Scale icon in the Reports menu, or right-click directly on the graph and select Set Scale. There you can change the time scale values to determine how your horizontal axis will be displayed, and then adjust the vertical scale values to determine how your vertical axis will be displayed. You can also change the unit type to conform all data on the vertical axis to the selected unit. Then click OK. You also have the option of manually scaling the axes of your graph. Just note that this scaling will not translate if you export the data to an Excel document. Do this hover over either axis, hold the control button on your keyboard, and click and drag until you're happy with its scale. You can also change the colors on your graph in order to highlight certain information, make it more legible, or just fit your personal aesthetic. To change your graph's background color, select Background Color in the Reports menu bar. A drop-down menu will provide you with a number of default colors, but if you'd like to choose something else, you can select more colors and find exactly what you're looking for. You can also change the color of individual lines and their thickness. If you'd like to change the default background colors and line thickness for all future graphs, you can do so by going to File and selecting Options. Then select Reports and scroll down until you find those settings. After making your adjustments, click OK. And with that, you now know everything you need in order to adjust your graph to meet your needs and preferences. Next, we'll talk about data tables. Data tables allow the user to view the data and channels from the current graph as a consecutive list of data points. This is especially useful for exporting the data into other programs like Excel, or for obtaining all information on specific points of interest after your study. First, we're going to turn our time markers back on because data tables are capable of displaying them. Then we'll select Generate Data Table in the Reports menu bar. Now you'll see the data table report is a list of all the readings, and if we scroll down, we can also locate both of our time markers that we set earlier. I mentioned this is useful for exporting to Excel, and you can do that seamlessly by selecting Export to Excel, also located in the Reports menu bar. And finally, there's Statistics Reports. Statistics reports are used to calculate and identify specific relationships between readings. To generate a statistics report, go up to the reports menu bar and select Generate. You'll see the summary information has been generated automatically at the top, and below that is a detailed list of all the different datasets currently being used in the report. Finally, at the bottom, you'll find that the default statistics have been generated automatically. These include key points of data, such as the different channels, the maximum and minimum readings, averages, and standard deviations. If you require additional information in your report, you can add additional statistics by either selecting the Add Remove button in the menu bar, or by clicking the plus sign to the right of the current statistics. This will bring up a menu of all available statistics that you can choose from. 
What's nice is that no matter what you choose, the software will automatically generate the results based on your data. Once you're done entering your information, the new statistic will be added to your list. You can also remove non-relevant data from your report by selecting a statistic and hitting remove at the bottom. You can then also reorder your statistics in order to push the most relevant data to the top of your report or pull down data that's less important. Now I mentioned that these are the default statistics, but you can also adjust the defaults yourself by going to File and selecting Options. Select Reports and hit the button labeled Default Statistics. From here you can choose to add or remove statistics as relevant to your workflow and then close it out. And finally, with all of that, you now know the basics for using the Magitech 4 software in tandem with your devices. 